So good afternoon, everyone. I hope you are enjoying the conference. And I'm going to introduce you now the second keynote speaker of this 2019 ECINEC meeting, Marianne Bertrand. She's a distinguished professor at the University of Chicago Booth, and she has made very important contributions in the, field of, in the fields of labor, development economics, corporate finance, and gender issues. Today, she's going to talk about corporate philanthropy and politics. So thank you very much for having uh, come to present today, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much for, um, for inviting me. Uh, and let me just try to, um, to motivate this work. So I think we have, a, we have an understanding that the decision that lawmakers make or regulators make can be distorted by uh, pressures that they receive from, uh, from special interests. So think about lawmakers' decision to increase the minimum wage or extend the earned income tax credit. Think about you know kind of corporate tax policy, but think about every domain that is within the realm of uh, of lawmaking and uh, and rulemaking. And and we have several well documented uh, channels via which these interest groups. I'm going to talk a lot about corporations here. Um, can uh, can influence uh, the outcome of the lawmaking and rulemaking process. So there's obviously direct contributions that can be made to a campaign. So when you think about corporations, corporations set up a political action committee, a PAC, and give money to politicians' campaign. Uh, we also have you know another mechanism, which is this independent expenditures into campaigns. So think about political ads, you know, mechanism that has been broadly extended via the Citizens United decision in the early uh, 2010. Lobbying is another kind of well-studied mechanism. And there are other things, such as the revolving door. I think it's called la pantoufle in France. The idea that you, know, you may be able to buy some outcome from lawmakers because you give them the promise of a job in your company uh, in the future. Um, as I said, there's a very large literature that has studied those mechanisms. You know, it's in between economics and political science. Uh, most of the work really has been focused on, on kind of direct campaign contributions, so the study of PACs, and there's been also uh, quite a lot of work uh, on, uh, on lobbying. Now, within this context, there's, there's such a thing as, a, as, as what's called the Tullock puzzle. So, well, you know, your prior is a huge, you know, a huge amount of money that's invested by these interest groups in the U.S., uh, in fact, some people have reflected on these amounts and have said, well, these amounts, in fact, are just too low. They are too low, especially if you put them in context of like the stakes. They are trillions of dollars that the U.S. government is deciding um, on, you know, how to allocate. And, you know, the amount that are being spent on direct comp contributions or, or lobbying are very small in comparisons to that. So if you really think that money influences political outcomes, the, you know, the amounts appear, appear too small. And there are many you know, different answers to this, you know, this puzzle. The one I would like to focus on uh, in this lecture is, is the possibility that the current um, tools of political influence that we are studying are just the tip of the iceberg. That there are other ways, other ways that corporations, interest groups can try to, uh, to influence the political process. Uh, and in particular, this other way that I'm going to be focusing on today is corporate philanthropy. All right? So corporate philanthropy is very large. If you compare it to how much money is being spent by corporations uh, in the ad campaign contributions or spent in lobbying. So I'm going to look at corporate foundations in this paper. And this is a very biased list. This is a list of the 10 largest corporate foundations in the 112th Congress that spans the year 2011 and 2012. And next to each of these you know, foundations, obviously, I think as you see the name of the foundation, you can figure out which corporation is behind this corporate foundation. So you see how much money they spend uh, in charitable giving, in millions of dollars, and how much they spend the corporations behind the foundation on PAC and lobbying. So really talking about multiple orders of magnitude larger amounts that is spent on corporate philanthropy by these, uh, by these firms compared to PAC and lobbying. So even if a small fraction of this corporate philanthropy was, was motivated by you know, an attempt to influence lawmaking and rulemaking process, the sums involved could actually swamp the sums that are involved in these most studied uh, channels of, of influence. So what else is interesting about you know, kind of philanthropy as a source of influence is that it is much, much less transparent than studying PACs or studying lobbying, for a sort of reason I'm going to talk about in a minute. It's not impossible to study it. I'm going to give you in this talk, you know, kind of one approach, which is one that we followed, but it makes it harder, you know, just to track it. It makes it harder to study. Um, and I think 
Furthermore, even if you could, even if, when you can study corporate philanthropy, uh, if you think about the public relations uh, response to a corporation engaging in corporate philanthropy, you can imagine that's much more positive than the kind of response the corporations get for being the top lobbying spenders in the US, right? In fact, a lot of corporations, you know, kind of get a lot of positive reviews in newspapers and the media because they give back to society. Um, and then the final kind of reason why we think it's an interesting mechanism is that there's currently essentially no regulation when it comes to, you know, kind of corporate philanthropy. That's obviously very different from uh, kind of campaign contributions where there are very strict limits on how much a given corporation can give to a particular candidate or particular party. It's also very different from lobbying where, where there are no limit on how much corporations or an interest group can spend on lobbying. There are disclosure requirements in the US since the mid 1990s, which are in fact unlike what you have in Europe where these disclosure requirements really do not exist like they do in the US. But corporate philanthropy, CSR, is much less regulated. Uh, and it's also um, kind of tax advantage in that corporations don't have to pay taxation on their, uh, on their corporate philanthropy, okay? So what we're gonna do in this paper is take the idea or investigate the, possi the possibility that corporations may use their philanthropy at least in part as a way to achieve, uh, to achieve political influence. So I'm gonna do this in, in two parts. In science, this talk is based on two papers, one that's kind of more finished than the other one, and they're both exploring you know, independent mechanisms via which corporations may use their philanthropy as a way to uh, um, uh, improve their, uh, the political outcome uh, in their favor. So the first part of the paper is going to be fo focused on the lawmaking process. And I'm going to try to demonstrate that corporations use their philanthropy to try to influence legislators. The second part of the paper, which is much more kind of a work in progress, is going to be focused on the rulemaking process. So the idea that, you know, kind of Congress pass a law, say Dodd-Frank, but that's just the first step. After Dodd-Frank, there's going to be a lot of work to try to translate this law into rules by the SEC, by other agencies. So the second part of the paper is really focused more on this agency side. And it's also going to try to demonstrate another mechanism via which corporations might be using their philanthropy to influence now the, the regulators, not the lawmakers. Okay? So that's kind of the the roadmap for where I'm going. All right, so let me, let me talk about part one, which is based on John work with uh, Mathilde Bombardini, uh, Ray Fismant, and uh, Francesco, uh, Francesco Trebi. Um, and let me just kind of give you two anecdotes to try to motivate where we're going. In a sense, kind of the goal of these anecdotes is to try to kind of give you a sense of like how philanthropy by corporations could be a tool of influence. And I think there are really two ways we think about this. One is kind of related to the idea that it's going to help mobilize voters. It's something that politicians could, get, could take credit for. Right? So here's one example. It's an extreme example. I'll tell you why in a second. This is um, Joe Baca. He was, I believe, a, a member of Congress, of the House of Representatives. And he has his own, actually, nonprofit. Right? And he gets lots of kind of... Um, citizens that really like him because of all the good work that his nonprofit is doing in this congressional district. But when you look as to where the money of his nonprofit is coming from, it is coming from a lot of large corporations, okay? So he's getting credit in his district for a lot of work, good work, right? Service work, homeless work, that is in a sense being financed by corporation. You can think about this more generally though, you know, kind of forget about just nonprofits that are owned by a particular member of Congress. Think about all the nonprofits that are located in a particular congressional districts, right? You can imagine, you know, kind of congressmen going to the ribbon cutting ceremony of the new center that's being, you know, financed by UBS, for example, and getting credit with their constituents because, uh, because of that. That's one channel. The other channel is really just much more the pet projects. Now, you can read this anecdote, but essentially this looks like this. This is an opera somewhere in Pennsylvania, and this opera receives a lot of money from Boeing, Lockheed Martin, Northrop, General Dynamics, a lot of, you know, kind of corporations that are in the defense contract business. It happens to be that the wife of this uh, member of the house that is on the relevant committee for the allocation of defense contracts is just a big fan of this opera. 
Okay, so that's what I'm going to call the pet projects, right? So there are a set of nonprofits out there that are that have ties to members of Congress or their or their family, and one way you could buy influence is by catering to those particular nonprofits and get some you know kind of favor in exchange, right? So these are two kind of ideas you should have in mind as I deploy the the research strategy for the first part of the paper. All right, so what are we going to do? Are we just going to ask whether corporations, as I said, use at least some of their charitable giving as a way to cater to the interests of politicians that are particularly uh, important to them? I'm going to try to show you evidence of this in multiple forms. Um, uh, yeah, what's the point of summarizing this, given I'm going to get there? All right, so here. All right, so, so just first, like a step back. How, how do we test whether uh, interest groups are buying policies? Right? So there are really two approaches that have been followed. The first one is to essentially study votes of members of Congress and then see whether the way members of Congress vote is related to how much campaign contributions they get, for example. Right? There's a whole kind of cottage industry of these kind of papers, often one law at a time. It's kind of a mixed literature in terms of like the findings. Some papers find strong evidence of influence. You may have seen the paper on Dot Frank that Mian, Sufi, and Trebi did a long time ago, where you could see money from Wall Street really influencing Congress' decision to bail out the banks. But overall, it's kind of mixed in its finding. And I think one reason why this literature is mixed in its finding is that it's constrained by what part of the political process it can study. It can only study the votes that happen on the floor of Congress. But if you have any understanding of the way politics works in the US, a lot of the process of influence happens way before you reach the, the floor of the House and the Senate. Right? It's about killing bills when they are on a subcommittee or committee level, or it's about kind of really changing the nature of the bills that end up on the floor of the House and the committee. The second approach, which is the one that we're going to follow, uh, is essentially asking, look, if I look at the campaign contributions that members of Congress are receiving and from whom they are receiving it, does it make sense? Right? Does it make sense given the kind of influence particular lawmakers have? So you have certain lawmakers that sit on committees that are more relevant to banks than to a defense contractor. You would expect campaign contributions by defense contractors to go more to members of Congress that sit on the committees that are relevant to defense and campaign contributions in the context of agriculture to go more to people that sit on the agriculture committee. So this is the approach that we're going to be, that we're going to be following. Right. So again, what's the idea? Take all the members of Congress um, and uh, look at the uh, contributions that they, are, that they are receiving and assess whether it's quote unquote the right people that are getting money from the right corporation if we think the money is used to try to influence decision. Okay? What's nice about you know, kind of this research design is that the constitutions of a particular committee in the House or in the Senate changes from Congress to Congress. So when we use the word Congress here, I have like a two-year period right, between elections. And so you know, you're going to have changes as to who, which particular individual in the House is relevant to Boeing in one year compared to the next year. And we're going to use this variation uh, in the empirical approach. Now, the big drawback of this research approach is that we're going to never, we're not going to, we are never going to see the pro quo part. Right, so we're going to see money going to where we'd expect it to be if we anticipate money is being used to try to change decisions, but we're never going to be able to look at the pro quo part. Did the decision change because the money was given? Right, so that's going to be a drawback that you know, we'll have in our paper and it's part of this literature. All right, so let me just now kind of slow down for one minute and, and tell you kind of the first test that we conduct. There's really two empirical tests in this paper, uh, and, and they're really straightforward. Um, so let me just uh, slow down for one minute. Right, so imagine, you know, imagine the US and divide the US in its congressional districts, okay? 400 plus of them. Now, you can look in every um, time period, the two-year time period of a particular Congress, right, at how much contributions, philanthropy, a particular congressional district, that is one member of the House associated with it, receive from particular cooperation, okay? And then what we're gonna ask is whether the amount of contributions that a given firm make to a particular congressional district increases when that particular congressional district 
has sitting, you know, representing this district, someone that sits on the committee that's relevant to the corporation. Does that make sense? So we're going to have time variation, as I said, because, you know, members of the House switch committee assignment over, um, over time. Some of them kind of enter and exit, but some switch committee assignment, even if they've sat in Congress for long. Uh, we're going to do all of this kind of, you know, exploding this time series variation, very importantly, controlling for these fixed effects at the firm congressional district level, right? These gamma, no, that's not gamma. What is this thing? I don't know. What? No. No, not, okay, it's not epsilon. They know this one. Okay, so the, the one with the FD. This is where, what? Delta. Delta FD. So what are these delta FDs? They are, they are fixed effects for corporation times congressional district, right? So why are those important? Well, you know, think about Cargill, which is in the agribusiness in the U.S. Cargill, for lots of reasons, is going to give more money to districts that are in the Midwest. And there's also some pattern that members of the House that come from the Midwest are going to be more likely to sit on the agricultural type committees, right? So that would create a mechanical relationship between contributions and uh, this, you know, kind of log issues covered in my, in, in, in my regression. So we're going to control for those fixed amount of, you know, those fixed tendencies in the research design, really exploiting the variation that in some years, there'll be someone from that particular congressional district in Kansas that is on the agricultural committee and not in other years. Okay. All right. So I think I've said, you know, all of this. So this issue covered variable is essentially, you know, kind of, it's going to be a continuous variable, but I can also treat it as a zero one. Take a particular congressional district, right? Look at whether the, the representative of this district sits on the committee that's relevant to the corporation. How do I measure whether, the, co the, whether the, the committee is relevant to the corporation? Well, I can do that by, looing, by looking at what issue this corporation lobbies on, right? So I have access to lobbying data that tells me that in this particular year, tax issues are particularly important to Boeing. Well, I'm going to go and look at which congressional districts have someone that sits on the finance committee in that particular Congress, okay? Okay, good. All right. So let me just tell you a little bit about, you know, about the data. So everything is really standard from kind of a political economy type paper. The only thing that's non-standard is the first data set that we use, right? So we have information on corporate philanthropy from, uh, from this website, which is called Foundation Search. So what is, you know, what is this website? First, I think it's kind of interesting to know how I ended up kind of with this website. I was very interested in trying to understand why people give money to the University of Chicago. Um, and so I, I started talking to our development office and, you know, they said, well, you know, we use this website. What, do, what, do, what would the University of Chicago, in fact, most universities in the U.S. use this website? Well, here's a rich individual. He's on our radar. Let's go and figure out what his family foundation has been giving money to in the past. And that gives us a way to, you know, approach him with a set of things that we could be doing that we kind of know he would, he would be interested in. So what this data has is just a digitalization of, you know, kind of uh, tax data. So every corporate foundation is set up as a non-for-profit. And every non-for-profit has got to file a Form 990. And in this Form 990, among many other things, you have to list all of the grants that your corporate foundation has been, has been making, as long as the grant is above $4,000. You know who received the money, which nonprofit received the money, where it's located, uh, et cetera. So important to pose here. There's more to corporate philanthropy than what we can study. There's other ways that corporations give money. They can give directly. They can give directly from the treasury without going via their foundation. That is totally not transparent. Trying to figure out how the giving that corporations give directly is being spent is not something that we can study. It's so worth keeping in mind, this is, only, this is the most visible part of corporate philanthropy that we can study. All right, so we limited our sample to the corporate foundations that correspond to companies that were in the Fortune 500 in 2014 or the S&P 500. So we have a total of uh, nearly 350 uh, different corporate foundations uh, in our data. Okay. Now, we link this data to IRS data that is simply a listing of all of the nonprofits in the US, all of the organizations that you could be giving money to. And we're talking about a million plus of these nonprofits in the US. It's a massive, massive business. Um, that, you know, we're going to use this match to match it to the, the 990 data. 
Uh, this allows us to put every nonprofit in the US in a particular congressional district, okay? And then after that, it's much more standard. We have, mo we have data on direct campaign contributions, PAC contributions by corporation. Uh, we have obviously data on member of, uh, of the House uh, and Congress. We have, you know, kind of lobbying data, which we use to identify which particular topic are of importance to a particular corporation at a given point in time. We have data on committee assignment. And then we have this metric that Mathilde, Francesco, and I developed a few years back for a paper we did on lobbying that allows us to make a mapping from a particular issue that's lobbied uh, um, by corporation and the congressional districts in the House and the Senate that are overseeing this particular issue. All right? So, and I think that's basically that. So here's a summary of, you know, of the data um, you know, if you think about the data at the foundation year level, uh, the average uh, amount that is being given by foundation a given year is about $5 million. Uh, it's about 125 grantees per corporate foundation per, uh, per year. Uh, if you think about the data at the district congress uh, level, the typical member of the house is sitting on two different committees, but there's quite a lot of variation in that. And then if you think about the data at the foundation district congress level, which is really the level at which we're going to use the data, these are the main, uh, the main summary statistics. Okay? All right. So let me just get going with some of the results. Uh, and I'm not going to start by, um, <clears throat> I'm going to start by just showing you a correlation which I've not talked about yet. But this is essentially telling that if you looked at the, the, the relationship between where corporation make the corporate philanthropy and which member of the house they make campaign contributions to, there's a positive and significant relationship between the two. Right? So this is regressing corporate philanthropy from a given foundation, foundation slash firm, I'm going to use those kind of interchangeably, to a particular congressional district in a particular congress on how much campaign contributions the firm behind the foundation is giving to this congressional district, to this particular member uh, of the house, of the congressional district. Now, there are different kinds of fixed effects that you want to put in this analysis for the reason I stated before, you know, our preferred specification is always going to be the one, you know, over here, where I'm looking within firm congressional districts and also allowing for changes over time in how much money is going to particular congressional districts, okay? So this relationship is positive, which is just a starting point. Now, um, and you can look at this, it's just, um, it's a fairly uh, robust relationship. So now let me move to, you know, the main results. And, and I'm going to start by looking at PAC money. So I'm going to do first the much more standard exercise that we have done in political science when trying to understand what drives which congressmen receive money from particular firm, right? Direct campaign contributions. So. Here, how much campaign contribution goes from firm F to Congressional District D as a function of whether or not this district is a district that is of relevance to the corporation because of the committee the individual in this district sit on, right? And the matching between that committee and the issues that the corporation cares about. So you can see that, you know, this relationship is positive. Again, our preferred specification are going to be the one on the right, where we control the mean tendency of Cargill to give to a particular congressional district in Iowa, uh, and really exploit the time series variation, right? And you can see, you know, you can do this on the continuous metric, or if you just like to turn congressional district on and off for cooperation the, in any issue, you get this very strong relationship, okay? So now, this is exactly the same specification, but the dependent variable has changed. So the dependent variable is no longer your standard how much campaign contributions is Boeing giving to a particular congressional districts. It is how much charity is the Boeing Foundation giving to that particular congressional district. But beyond that, everything else in the specification is the same. And again, you know, favorite specification are the one on the right, you find this positive relationship. Right? One thing that we do in the paper and I'm not going to spend much time on is try to take this one step further and try to give you a sense of you know, how much CSR, how much corporate philanthropy could be political in light of these estimates. The coefficients that are bolded in column four are the ones that we use to make this extrapolation based on a model that's full of uh, kind of hard to swallow assumptions. All right, so that's that part. You know, you can do a lot of heterogeneities on this result. 
So for example, you would expect that people that are chairs of committees might be particularly important targets for these mechanisms. You know, if you focus just on the chairs, you find same sign, larger magnitude. Okay, good. All right, so two additional things. Now one, you know, kind of sometimes the first, one of the reaction, if you don't want to believe that this is, you know, this is political, there's probably lots of things you could say. One of the things you could, uh, you could say is that it's really not an influence story, it's an information story, right? So Boeing happens to spend a lot of time talking to people that sit on the committee that deals with defense contract. And as they spend this time talking to people in the committee that, st that sit in defense contract, that decides on defense contract, they learn about fantastic nonprofits in their Congress, congressional districts, and because of that information, they start giving money to these nonprofits, right? Um, so maybe. So one way, I think the most obvious way to try to kind of address this is to look at exit, because once you get the information, the information should stick and it should not disappear, right? So, so what we do is essentially asking, take a particular congressional district and a senior congressman that was representing this district exits and is replaced by someone that's going to be more junior, right? What happens to corporate philanthropy in that particular congressional district? What happened to PAC giving in that particular congressional district? And this is what you find. So zero is a time where somebody that represents a particular congressional district that was quite senior finishes his career and is being replaced by someone more junior that has less influence. You can see, if you look at PAC money, that the amount of campaign contributions to that particular commercial district goes down. If you do the same picture for corporate philanthropy, you find similar mechanism, right? So this exit story is hard to reconcile with um, the information, you know, the information story that you may think about. All right. So now, the last test that that we do in this paper is is essentially kind of more about the pet project view, right? So so far. We have used geography, particular congressional district, as a proxy for the link between a politician and a charity slash corporation, okay? But sometimes these links may not depend on, you know, on geography. So what else could you do? Well, there's, um, there's a form that every legislator has got to fill. In fact, actually members of the executive as well, which is a personal financial disclosure form. Uh, where they have to disclose all of their assets and a lot of other stuff, including whether they hold positions uh, on the board of for-profit and not-for-profit, okay? So what we did is essentially use this personal financial disclosure form to identify a set of non-profits that we know to be of relevance to congressmen because they happen to sit on the board of these non-profits, okay? Could do this way more fancier. We could try to look, the, try to trace the wife, trace the children. Right now, we just did the link with the members of Congress. So I gave them a sample of a thousand plus nonprofits, for which we could establish a link between a member of Congress and the nonprofits. So then we asked two questions. The first was is simply, is there any evidence that those particular nonprofits that have linked to members of Congress get more corporate charity? And then number two, much more in line of the research design, in the first half of the paper. Um, do these nonprofits get particularly large amount of corporate charity when they have a tie to a member of Congress that is relevant to the corporations because of committee assignment? Okay. So here's this. So the first one, you know, do nonprofits connected to legislators receive more corporate charity? It's obviously kind of a very descriptive correlational exercise. I still find it kind of interesting because of how stable this relationship is to all of the sources of biases you could imagine, right? So what is this? This is how much contributions a particular nonprofit received from uh, the corporate foundations in our data as a function first of whether or not they are one of these thousand plus nonprofits that have linked to members of Congress or the number of links to Congress they have. Some nonprofits have got multiple members of Congress sitting on their board. And you can see that, you know, these numbers suggest that, um, I'm sorry, the sample is obviously the universe of nonprofits. That's the two million uh, data. So you can see like the, the five is basically saying that these nonprofits that have tied to members of Congress receive five fold more uh, corporate philanthropy than the other nonprofits. 
Now, obviously, you could think that these must be larger nonprofits. These must be nonprofits that are in bigger urban centers. These might be nonprofits that are particular sectors of the economy. A lot of, you know, kind of reason why you may not trust this five-fold coefficient. And as you move down these columns, what we basically do is try to, try to saturate these regressions with all of those controls that we think might be murkying this correlation. And what's really remarkable is just how stable this coefficient is, right? So at the very end, the five-fold has become a 4.6 uh, times higher amount of, of, of corporate philanthropy. So it might still be unobservables, but the relationship is very, uh, very, very stable. And then finally, and this is really the last result in this paper, it's essentially using now the same research design as before. Take what is 4 million, so we're trying to kind of think about it. We have these 1,000 plus nonprofit that have linked to members of Congress times all of the year in our data times the number of corporations we have in our data. That's how we get to 4 million, right? And now we ask whether the likelihood that any of these nonprofits receive a grant from a particular corporation increases when this nonprofit becomes relevant to the corporation, again, because of the committee that the congressman that is a link to this nonprofit is associated with. And there are many ways you can run the specification throughout all of them. I guess one, we find positive and significant relationships. When the selected set of nonprofit that have, conne that have connection to Congress, you know, kind of have further relevance to a particular corporation, there's evidence that the foundation behind the corporations start giving more to these nonprofits. Okay? So, as I mentioned, you know, kind of what we try to do in a paper is try to kind of then answer the next question, which is if you believe this is evidence of corporate philanthropy in used political influence, you know, how much of corporate philanthropy could be political given the estimates that we have in the paper? So, I'm not going to take you through this model. You can, you know, kind of look at it in the paper, you can disagree with some of these assumptions, but the estimate that we get under this model would suggest that up to 16% of corporate philanthropy could be political via this particular mechanism, right? I'm going to talk next about another mechanism, but via this particular mechanism, you can make it up to 16%, which is, in dollar terms, you know, kind of way more than, you know, the PAC contributions or uh, all the lobbying spending in 2016. All right, so... What do we make of all of this? You know, kind of, I think the welfare implications are, are really of two types. So on the one hand, you could say, well, that's kind of okay because this is money that's going to nonprofits, but it certainly tells me that the, the, um, the, the decisions about which nonprofit to give to are not driven by Esther's research as to which nonprofit makes more of a difference, but are really driven by very different considerations. So you can think that it's affecting the misallocation of, you know, kind of uh, charitable money. And obviously, just like every other form of influence, this is potentially affecting the decisions that he made by, uh, by congressmen um, because of <coughs> this uh, influence. This tool, as I said before, is very much undisclosed and is tax, tax exempt. Right? So it suggests you know, maybe we need more disclosure uh, to this. And, and to me also, I think it really suggested that as we think about ways to strengthen campaign finance rule, we really have a bit of a whack-a-mole model. Is that if you screw if you tie, tie the screw, what's the expression? I don't know. If you try to control, you know, kind of die con campaign contribution better, you know, you know, a form of influence could just come up via, you know, via other mechanisms. 